Hi there, and welcome to another in the HSC Chemistry series. Uh, this video is video number 10 in the topic of chemical monitoring and management. And in this one, we're going to look at atomic absorption spectroscopy. The last two videos focused on the identification of ions, cations and anions. And one of the processes that we used in order to identify those ions was precipitation. Unfortunately, the problem with precipitation is that you have to have a reasonably large number of ions present in order to get a precipitate. It may well be that a certain ion is present in solution, but it is not present in sufficiently high numbers for a precipitate to form, particularly for some substances which are only slightly soluble in water. So what happens when we have very, very tiny amounts that we want to detect? Well, one of the techniques is based on flame tests. Um, but it's been a technique that's been developed as a far more accurate and precise method of measuring the concentrations of unknown cations. And because it uses a flame test, this is, or because it incorporates a flame with a spectra, then that's why this is a test that's specifically focused on cations. In general, spectroscopy is the study of the interaction between electromagnetic radiation and matter. And we've kind of um, touched on this a few times before. In fact, the whole understanding of the fact that the sun, for example, is made of hydrogen and helium has come from the fact that we've used the study of spectra. There's two main types of spectra, absorption and emission. So absorption uh, spectroscopy is about a particular atom absorbing certain amounts of energy and if you provide say a sample of white light with all of the colors of the rainbow then absorption will just take those particular um, uh, colors that correspond to specific wavelengths out of that spectra and you'll just see them as dark lines. Emission is when that, 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 that atom usually with excited electrons actually releases the energy as those excited electrons fall back to ground state and then we see them as a series of uh, bright colored lines um, as a result that correspond to each of those um, particular electrons that's moved from its excited state back to its ground state. As far as we're concerned, we want to look at what happens when we vaporize or turn a liquid solution into a vapor, into a gas, and we basically put it through a flame. When we do that, different elements will absorb light of different frequencies. And not only that, but the elements that absorb light of certain frequencies will absorb, will absorb more of that light if they are in higher concentrations. That is, if there are more atoms available to absorb that light. The first six spectrometer, or one of the first spectrometers, was developed by uh, an Australian, Alan Walsh, in the CSIRO labs. And his technique was basically to put together it, um, a simplified version of, or, or modern, the, the one that you'll see in the next slide is a simplified version of, of what he used in order to try and use a very precise technique for identifying the concentration of cations in solution that were in very low um, concentrations. So we want to try and identify the presence of certain substances and also, and more importantly, their concentration simply by analyzing the spectra of light that's being absorbed by uh, the vaporized form of different solutions. And the thing that's great about this technique is we can get concentrations down to the parts per million or even parts per billion. So here's that diagram I was stumbling over. It's a, I guess, a simplified overview of what happens with atomic absorption spectroscopy. And it's the main components that we need to look at here. The first thing that's very important is that the cathode should correspond to the substance that you're looking at. So for example, we haven't talked about hard water yet, but when we do, we'll talk about the fact that calcium ions are one of the substances that are present in hard water. And hard water is just water that's very difficult to lather. And that's because of the presence of calcium and magnesium ions. But that's a story for later. For today, if you just look at the fact that if we wanted to detect whether or not there were any calcium ions in a sample of water, what we could do is use this technique. We would need a cathode made of calcium. We would need to be able to um, allow light that was um, being emitted from that cathode um, to pass through a heated region of gas. Now, this heated region of gas, um, I've indicated 1,000 uh, degrees C, you can actually use um, um, 
this technique with much higher temperatures, but as a basic one, this works. And what we do is we take the, say, the um, calciums in water samples, which we think are hard water. So we put our water samples in here. And what we do is we basically um, use an atomizer kind of arrangement, the same way as a, um, a spray can or something like that, just atomizes the um, solution and sprays it into the flame. Now, as it goes into the flame, the wavelengths of light that are being emitted by the cathode are going to correspond to those wavelengths of light that are going to be absorbed by the calcium atoms that are now present in this region. What that's going to mean is that they will absorb some of the energy and we have a second beam which basically is our uh, comparison and that is going to mean we're going to need to try and isolate all of the other wavelengths in order to specifically come up with the one that we want. So the light passes through from the cathode, it passes um, through the vaporized gases, some of that energy has been absorbed at particular wavelengths, and then through a series of mirrors and diffraction gratings, a specific wavelength will emerge, just the one, and that's why it's called a monochromator, which means one color, basically. Um, for calcium, for example, this would correspond to a wavelength of about 422 nanometers. So that would be the wavelength that would come out. It would pass through a slit in the monochromator and into a photomultiplier. And this is just a light multiplier that just increases the signal to one that can actually be um, viewed in an output display. So it converts that um, wavelength of light, that energy into an electrical display. And it gives us an output number. What we find is that if the concentration of calcium ions is higher, then the amount of absorbance will change as a consequence of that higher um, uh, concentration. And in fact, the relationship is a linear one. So the way that most atomic absorption spectroscopy works is that we actually start with a series of known concentrations for the um, substance that we're looking at. So we would start with, say, a few different known uh, concentrations of calcium solutions, and we would test them, and we would find their values, and then we would produce a little calibration graph, and then we would put in our unknown water samples in order to determine exactly what their concentration was in comparison to the graph. So let's just break this down a little bit more. The main components of atomic absorption spectroscopy then are the, the uh, hollow cathode lamp, which has the metal that we're testing, which we said in a previous example is calcium. The light that's given off by this lamp, which passes through the vaporized sample. The amount of absorption is proportional to the concentration of the metal, which means when we plot it, we get a straight line graph. The intensity of the light is measured by the photomultiplier as it comes out as a single wavelength. And by comparing the intensity with a series of control samples, then we can determine the um, degree of absorbance and hence uh, work from that absorbance to determine the concentration. This is an example of a calibration graph. So you can see that there's a number of different values which have been put in to create this graph. There's another one here, and there's another one here. And they sit on a straight line, and the graph's been um, drawn, and you can see that this is a comparison for um, calcium ions in parts per million against absorbance. What will then happen is for the points X and Y, these unknown samples will be placed into the spectrometer, and we will get those values. So you can see that um, the first value, the x value, is over here. So if this is going uh, 0 0.22, 0 0.24, 26, 28, and then 0.3, so this is coming in about halfway there. So this will be a value of, of around 0 0.25. Eh? And so we go across, we hit our line here, and then we come down to a value here, which is 45 parts per million. So therefore, in A, the calcium ion concentration 
is equal to 45 parts per million. Using the same strategy for y, we've got a value of around about 27. So for y, this is for x, for y, we have around about 27 parts per million. So a lower concentration of calcium ions in Y, sample Y, than there is in sample X. This sort of technique is one that you need to practice. I'll give you some uh, examples to um, construct calibration graphs and to extrapolate from those graphs or interpolate from those graphs um, different values of absorbance and the corresponding concentration of ions. The thing with AAS is it's been extraordinarily useful to us in, in identifying the presence of certain types of ions that we were unable to identify previously. So particularly trace elements in the soils, micronutrients, um, are very important in the growth of different organisms, especially plants, and therefore they need to be present in the soils or present um, in their growing environments. Uh, and if they're in very, very tiny um, concentrations, it can be very difficult to detect their presence. So the development of AAS has certainly allowed this um, uh, to start happening, that we can start to sample our different soils, look at the different types of trace elements that are present, and to um, get more of an understanding of the effect of the presence or absence of these trace elements on the growth of different organisms. In addition to this, there's certain types of chemicals which if they exist in the environment can create significant problems. Um, pollution, ill health of organisms, um, things like uh, carcinogens, lead for example has been linked to um, higher incidence of cancer. And so the use of AES allows those components that may cause problems to be detected within the environment. Um, so we can either counter them if they're nutrients, we can counter the low levels by adding additional nutrients in for soils, for example, for plant growth. But we can also identify if there's a particular deficiency of certain types of elements like cobalt or molybdenum. And even um, to an analysis of the types of pollution that are uh, present in particular uh, waterways. So the presence of copper and aluminium, or lead, as I mentioned, particular problem uh, because of its link as a carcinogen. Um, zinc, present in oysters, and even uh, another heavy metal, mercury, present in fish. And obviously, the presence of these in some part of the food chain can then affect other organisms um, further up the food chain. So these are the sorts of questions that you're likely to get around AAS. So this is a question from 2008, a five mark question, and it's basically a five mark question because it's a big question that asks for the drawing of a graph and also extrapolation of that graph. So you can see that you've got some values in this table that are going to be your um, standards. So the standards will always be sitting along the bottom, along the X axis. So this will be our zinc, in this case, zinc solutions. And that's in uh, milligrams per litre, so you keep the unit. And then in the y-axis, that's where we have absorbance. There's often not a unit for absorbance, so absorbance units is fine. And then we're going to plot each of these pairs of data uh, to come up with some sort of a line graph. So I'll just make these little crosses so they're kind of a little easier to see. And then a straight line graph that goes through them. Then, of course, when we get a value like 2 point, uh, 0.28, then we need to come from wherever the value of 0.28 is in our table, um, sneak across and read our value of the concentration of zinc. And that's a very typical kind of example for the application of AAS. Thanks for watching.